How's it going, everyone? In this video, we are going to talk about the top five dividend compounders, a dividend investing strategy. And I promise it won't be photos of myself at the beach because nobody needs to see my beer belly and hobbit feet. They're really hairy. What is a dividend compounder? It's a dividend paying company that has the ability to grow 200% or even 500% the initial investment from capital appreciation and dividend reinvestments on a long time horizon. For example, what you see on your screen, Apple, in the past five years, they were able to grow 320%. And if you look on your right side, Costco was able to grow 230% in the past five years. So why do some dividend investors prefer dividend compounders with growth over high yield mature companies? Because company growth, capital appreciation, and total returns matter in the grand scheme of things. As dividend growth investors, we prefer a company with a bright future that has a lower starting yield with a much faster dividend growth rate such as dominoes, what you see on the bottom of your screen, right? They have a 1% dividend yield, but the dividend growth rate is 10%, meaning they're growing their dividends 10% year over year. We prefer that more so than a mature company like Verizon that has a very high juicy dividend yield, but very little to no dividend growth. 6.5%, but they are not really growing that dividend payout. When we talk about a mature company with a high dividend yield like Verizon, they are usually done growing and expanding, at least for the time being, which will be reflected in their stock price and trading multiple. And not only that, the company will usually commit to make the business decision to continue to pay the dividends because they cannot utilize the cash to expand the business any further without running into profitability issues. My only exceptions to this rule are companies designed in a way with a high dividend yield, such as REITs or BDCs. And that's because they're legally required to pay out 90% of their income as dividends. Anywho, I get nervous when investing in slow, old, and mature dividend companies with a high yield because their probability to cut dividends seems to always be around the corner. I think about AT&T, VF Corporation, the parent company of North Face, PPL, a utility company, and even Intel. The same way I get nervous whenever I visit the dentist. Not sure what it is, maybe it's a universal human experience to dread the idea of going to the dentist, but ever since I was a young wee little lad, going to the dentist was an experience that I just really did not enjoy. To be completely honest with you, I would rather get my nipples pierced and then put a chain that connects them together and for someone to pull on them than to go to the dentist. All right, the conversation is turning a little weird. So the top five dividends we are going to be looking at, I truly believe are amazing for beginners or experienced investors looking to get into dividends. We will review their dividend profile, dividend history, and look at their total return and Kager, aka compound annual growth rate. They are all high quality, strong, fast, and beautiful. I know winter is almost over, but if you look on the left side of your screen, it's kind of like a Patagonia jacket. None of these companies will be cheap, unpredictable, and fall apart like the jacket on the right, or like my hairstyle in the 90s when I used to put a tablespoon of gel into my hair. Do you remember back in the day when almost every single guy used to apply slimy gel into their hair? What were we thinking? But the 90s were a fantastic time to be alive, and I genuinely wish that I was an investor back then, but I wasn't. The five companies are Domino's Pizza, The Hershey Company, Meta, Norfolk Southern, and Visa. We have a lot to talk about and why I think these are the winners for the next 10 to 20 years. To my brain, it still feels like yesterday was 2010. I genuinely don't know how time has gone by so fast. And I'm at that point where sooner than later, I'm probably going to start growing gray chest hair. What a day to come. Domino's Pizza. Grown up in the 90s, they used to taste terrible, and everybody was a fan of Pizza Hut. Now, it's the complete opposite, because in 2008, Domino's decided to change their pizza recipe due to overwhelming feedback that they tasted like cardboard and stale ketchup. And when we think about Domino's, we think of them as a restaurant chain. But what I want to tell you today is that they're much more than that. Just like how McDonald's is basically a real estate company, think of Domino's as a supply chain company. 99% of 
the stores are owned and operated by franchisees that pay royalty fees to Domino's for marketing, for their ingredients to be shipped to them, and to operate under the brand. It's the franchisees that are running the show. Think about it as a business owner. Domino's headquarters takes care of all the details. You just have to leave the people making pizza and take care of producing the pizza. Domino's takes care of the supply chain, the delivery modality, the website to order the pizza, the brand name, the advertisements, and R&D to come up with new pizza ideas. And just look at how quickly Domino's is expanding. Back in 2015, their global retail sales was about $10 billion. And as of 2023 and the trailing 12 months, $18 billion. That's an 80% growth rate. And when you look at their operating income, they went from $400 million to $800 million. And if you think think Domino's in the U.S. tastes the best, my friend, you are absolutely wrong. Because if you go internationally, like to Japan or South Korea or Taiwan, the toppings that they put on their pizza seem a little wild, but my goodness, do they taste a lot more delicious than you could ever imagine. The franchise business model is amazing for Domino's because it allows them to focus on growing the brand, while the franchisees focus on execution. And here are some fun facts. More than 95% of Domino's franchisees in the U.S. started off as part-time pizza makers or delivery drivers. And on average, they typically own about nine Domino's stores. So say you live in Madison, Wisconsin. If you have seven to 11 Domino's in your city, almost every single one of them are going to be owned and operated by the same franchisee. And the crazy thing is, their footprint internationally is still in the early stages. Imagine what happens when Domino's can become as massive as McDonald's is. In the U.S., we see Domino's as cheap pizza, right? But my friend, I have traveled around the world and I will tell you, Domino's is not considered that way by others. In fact, Domino's is actually pretty expensive in Europe and Asia. And if you're still not convinced, digest this fact. Every single segment of their business is booming despite inflation. It's truly remarkable to see. And when you look at their current amount of stores that they're operating, it's roughly 13,400 stores, right? But Domino's has the vision and they're laying down the foundation to open up 18,500 stores by 2028. And Domino's biggest room for opportunity are in two major markets. One is going to be China and the other is India. And each one of these countries brings well over 1 billion people to become potential customers of Domino's. So I'm very bullish on the prospects of Domino's. Next, we have the Hershey Company. I made a very thorough, in-depth video about this company, so I won't tickle your feet and bore you. The bottom line up front is this. Candy, snacks, and chocolate will always be a fan favorite. Not just for watching movies, breakups, or Halloween. What I'm trying to say is that there's never a wrong time for chocolate. Whether it's camping in the mountains or 2 a.m. in the morning during a graveyard show shift. It's always going to be better with a Reese's peanut butter in your mouth. And for you meatheads out there, Hershey even has a protein bar line called One. This is a company that, in my opinion, is one of the best CPG stocks out there. And the best part is, out of the five companies on this list, they're probably the most undervalued right now. Now let's go ahead and talk about Meta. Everybody knows what Facebook and Instagram is at this point. And what you see on your screen right now is the advertising revenue by user geography. Obviously, the bulk of the revenue is generated by the US and Canada demographic. However, other parts of the world are catching up, such as Europe and Asia Pacific. All right, so maybe I just made an ignorant statement. Not everybody is going to know what Meta is. Maybe you were homeschooled or raised by a Mormon mom. Meta is in the business of selling your data and providing an outlet for companies to advertise on their platforms for a fee. And when I say that, I mean, based on who you are, what you like, they are able to provide accurate advertisements to you. Companies will pay big bucks for targeted ads to their correct demographic. For example, imagine that you're a company and you're spending millions of dollars on your advertising budget and you're showing a 90-year-old grandma non-stop ads about Tough Mudder. Yes, I'm sure Mildred wants to go run a 5K mud run obstacle course. But Facebook isn't just a place for ads. Facebook is also a platform where a majority of people stay up to date on current affairs and events. And that used to be Twitter. But Twitter has gone downhill, like my boob job. Let me tell you this, they were perky at 
first, but now they're sagging near my kneecaps. It's not a pretty picture to see. And I need you to stop picking your nose for a second and look on your screen with me. Look at the revenue growth over the years. This is what investors refer to as the top line. Do you see how it's increasing year over year? I mean, back in 2022, they had a little slip up, but other than that, they're now back on pace and they're roaring to new highs. They even increased their operating margin to 41%. That is pretty insane. Outside of the US, Meta also operates the most popular messaging app called WhatsApp. In the US, I feel like most people just use Discord, Facebook Messenger, or the phone's text function. But my friends in India, Taiwan, Germany, Sweden, and Nigeria all use WhatsApp. And what you see on your screen right now is Meta's net income trend. Now, net income is what investors refer to as the bottom line. And you're probably wondering, what is Meta's biggest risk and reward investment? Their biggest catalyst is the metaverse, where through virtual reality goggles, you can be anywhere in the world in any timeline. No lie, this one makes investors' buttholes pucker up and makes them nervous because they are not bullish in the vision that Mark Zuckerberg has. So for instance, with the metaverse, it's Black History Month right now. So in theory, through the metaverse, you would be able to have a one-on-one -on -one coffee chat with Martin Luther King Jr. Or you could sit in the congregation as he gives a sermon at church. I think that's pretty cool stuff. So in short, meta is a very profitable business, but they do have a reputation for being a rough place to work in the tech industry. It's nowhere near as bad as Amazon, but working at Meta is not very fun. So I hear from the MBA community. Anyways, a better alternative to Meta would be Google, but they do not pay a dividend like Meta does. So for now, Meta will hold its spot in the top five as they are a solid company, whether or not we like them. My apologies, I know this infographic seems a little chaotic, but now we're going to be talking about Norfolk Severn. And once again, I made a detailed video of Norfolk Severn is a railroad giant that operates in the eastern half of the U.S. They have over 19,000 miles of railroad networks across 22 states. They operate trains that move goods in the U.S. such as wood, metals, coal, and anything else that is really bulky for traditional trucks. Heck of a business model because can you imagine a startup trying to lay down railroad tracks in 2024? It ain't happening unfortunately. And I really wish something like that could happen because how awesome would it be to have high-speed railroad trains to travel all over the country. Like, can you imagine going from Atlanta to Chicago in under three hours by train? Because here's where I'm coming from. They say in 2024, a lot of the people in the dating scene are meeting each other through online platforms. If we had affordable, high-speed trains everywhere, that would make long-distance relationships a whole lot easier. And that's just my two testicles. I mean, two pennies. Next up, we are going to talk about Visa. Visa is a textbook example of a toll booth company that nearly everyone in this world uses with a wide economic moat and somehow does better year after year. Every time a Visa card is swiped, tapped, or entered digitally, they get a small percentage of the transaction as a service fee. As more and more people transition from using cash to card in order to pay for their daily expenses, Visa will only get fatter and fatter just like your ex-wife during Thanksgiving five years ago. And even if you use Apple Pay, Google Pay, or whatever on your phone, if you link up your Visa card, then Visa will still get their payment processing fee. And the best part is Visa works for credit cards, debit cards, and prepaid cards. How do we pay for groceries? With our card. How do we pay for our gym membership? With our card. How do we pay for a new pair of Hey Dudes? With our card. How do you finance your favorite only fans feed account with our card. So if you believe in the future of finance technology, then I think Visa is the clear winner. For instance, in comparison to the other payment processing companies, on your screen, look at the bottom, please. Look at the amount of payments that Visa processed. $11.6 trillion. And the second best was MasterCard at $6.5 trillion of payments in the same time period. And JCB is a Japanese company, but look at Discover's payment processing and American Express and just compare it all to Visa. Visa Visa is the magnificent, glorious, greatest of all time in fintech. And now it's time to look at their dividend numbers, which will tell the story of why they are the best. Kind of like snagging a $1.50 hot dog combo at Costco after shopping on a crowded Sunday, 
day and how you reward yourself for maneuvering through the aisles without getting hit by any of the other crazies out there. First up is Domino's. Now I get it, their dividend yield is not the juiciest. However, it is respectable because their annual dividend payout is $4.84 a share. And when you look at their average three-year dividend growth rate, that's sitting at 15.7%, which means they're growing this number by 15% year over year. Their payout ratio is sitting at 33%, which means it's really healthy and it's sustainable. And when you look at the graph right here, you can see that Domino's has been increasing their dividend payout for the past 11 years. So for instance, back in 2015, they used to pay out $1.24 per share as dividends. As you fast forward throughout the years, as of last year, now it's $4.84. I love Domino's. I love them. And next up, we have Hershey. Remember, this might be the only truly undervalued company on this list right now. Their dividend yield is sitting at 2.5% and they pay out $4.77 per share on an annualized basis. Their average dividend growth rate for the past three years is sitting at 12.2%. Their dividend payout ratio is 52%. A double digit dividend growth rate with a consistent pattern moving in the right direction is what we want to see as dividend growth investors. So back in 2015, their dividend payout was $2.33 per share. And now as of last year, it's $4.77. Let's move right along to Meta. Meta just implemented a dividend, so they don't have the history. However, what I want to call out is that their payout ratio is just 13% meaning that this dividend is going to be sustainable and they're not going to be hurting in order to pay it out. And for each share of Meta that you own, they will pay you $2 in dividends per year. And if I had to make an educated guess, I'm going to go ahead and assume that their dividend growth rate is going to be 10%, which is in line with like Microsoft and the other tech companies. And then there's Norfolk Severn. Their dividend yield is sitting at 2.1%. Their average dividend growth rate is 12.8%. Their dividend payout ratio is 67%. Back in 2015, they paid out $2.36 per share. You fast forward throughout the years, and now that dividend payout is $5.40 a share. So even though Norfolk Severn does not increase their dividend every single year, it is moving in the right direction if you look at it from a long-term horizon. And last but not least, we have Visa. Their dividend yield, I get it, is less than 1% at 0.75%. However, their dividend growth rate is sitting at 15.3%. Their dividend payout ratio is less than 24%. So in regards to Visa's balance sheet, their dividends that they're paying out is literally pennies and nickels. And when you look at Visa's dividend history, back in 2015, their dividend payout was 48 cents a share, which by the way, they had a stock split. Now their dividend payout is $2.08 a share. And now we will look at the company performance, their total return, and the Kager. First up is Domino's. So with an initial investment of $10,000 in August 2000, 2004, under the assumption of reinvesting the dividends back into this initial investment, in 20 years, give or take, that final balance would have been $656,000. And when you break that down year over year, that's roughly a 24% caker. But here's where things get interesting. During their best year, they grew at a rate of 112%, and that was back in 2011. However, during Domino's worst year, they went down by negative 64%. And that's why it's so important when it comes to investing, it's not about the brain. Rather, it's about the stomach. You got to have the stomach to hold on through the worst years because if you zoom out and look at it, a high quality company like Domino's with a good business operations tends to recover. So if you bought Domino's back in 2006 and then you saw your investment go down by the same amount and then the following year go down even more and you sold out, you would have missed out on all of these gains throughout the following years. And that's why mature and experienced investors say you should buy and hold. But then again, there's nothing wrong with selling if you want to sell. And next up, we have the Hershey Company. So with an initial investment of $10,000 in January of 2004, you fast forward 20 years, then you would have roughly $80,000. And that Kager is 10.8%. During their best year, they went up by 46%. And during their worst year, they went down by negative 18%. 
But who's honestly going to complain about their $10,000 growing to $80,000 in 20 years? Who? Who is going to complain? And now it's Meta's turn. They began to publicly trade in June of 2012. So if you had $10,000 back then invested into Meta in the beginning, now it would spit out a final balance of $131,000. And here's what I want to call out. Meta is a tech company that everyone associates with high growth, high returns, right? But if I go back a few slides, look at the performance of Domino's Pizza. And that's why all I'm trying to say is you can find success in the stock market in any industry as long as you pick and invest in a winner. So Domino's Kager, how much they grew year over year is 23.9%. We're going to fast forward and take a look at Meta's. Meta's is also sitting at around 24% during their best year, which was last year. They went up roughly 200%. During their worst year, they went down by negative 64%. And I'm going to be honest with you, when Meta was going down in 2000. 22 by a large margin. That's when I started to buy in by the boat load because I knew for a fact that Meta at that time was super undervalued. And I knew that the investors in Wall Street were overreacting to Mark Zuckerberg's Metaverse expenditures. I am just pleasantly pleased that Meta is now a dividend paying company. I just need Google to follow suit and pay a dividend as well. Please, Google. And next up, we have Norfolk Severn. So in January 2004, 20 years ago, if you invest in $10,000, now it would be $153,000. Year over year, how much they grew is roughly 14.58%. That's their Kager. During the best year, they went up by 55%. During their worst year, it looks like in 2015, they went down by negative 20%. And finally, we have Visa. $10,000 invested in April 2008, which by the way, was an absolute terrible time for Visa to go public because the recession happened during that time. However, that $10,000 invested in the beginning until now, well, it's looking like $195,000. That's roughly 200 grand. Their Kager is 20.66%. This is an amazing company. So when you take into consideration Visa's total returns and Kager year over year, your heart and heart becomes softened at the idea that Visa doesn't pay exactly the highest dividend yield. Because in lieu, they're growing your capital appreciation beyond belief. Well, hold on there, buddy. Why isn't the dividend yield your priority if you say that you're a dividend growth and investor because there are other dividend metrics that are more important, Jim Bob. Please sit down. I need the company to have strong financials, to be growing their top line year after year, aka their revenue, for their free cash flow to be in a positive trend, for the dividends to be growing at a rate better than inflation, and for the dividends to be sustainable from a solid payout ratio. Then, and only then, do I consider the dividend yield. If I prioritize the dividend yield first, then I'll end up turning a blind eye to the red flags. Like when you decide to be cute in the moment and you try out that two-week-old seafood that's marked down as 50% off. For the sake of your toilet, I wouldn't recommend buying old fish. But anywho, it's better to have a healthy business that pays a dividend versus a struggling business that pays a dividend. Think of the dividend as the cherry on top. The ice cream should be the main attraction. And in this case, the ice cream is a solid company that has strong financial fundamentals and business opportunities operations that are efficient. Have you heard of the muffin man? I mean, have you heard of the high yield dividend trap? Yield traps are recognized by three metrics. A stupid high dividend yield, constantly declining share price, and steadily decreasing dividends. Which means if you invest in a dividend yield trap, you are losing money. For example, AT&T. Sadly, this is a high yield dividend trap. It looks like a great investment opportunity because you see that 6.5% dividend yield until you realize that they have a large amount of debt that's out of control. They have a very high yield dividend that's beyond their sustainability. Despite cutting their dividend in half back in 2022, their top line revenue is decreasing year after year. Their bottom line net income is negative. And here's the thing. 10 years ago, in January 2014, if you had invested 10 grand into at and that investment would be worth $12,200 today. How does that matter? Well, back in 2015, at and was trading for about $25 a share. And now you're lucky to see a trading for about $17 a share. This is a dividend yield trap. Take a look at this. Back in 2015, their dividend payout was $1.88 per share. You fast forward throughout the years, now you're getting 
11 cents per share as dividends. It went downtown. Now, when you see the 6.5% dividend yield, does it still look juicy? Is it a good time to buy any of these companies right now? It depends. You have to assess their intrinsic value to figure out an acceptable buy price. And not only that, you will want to do a deep dive into their finances, balance sheet, and look at their earnings reports to see if you believe in them and their future. But this list would be my recommendation of stocks with dividends for beginners. Sure, they might not be cheap, but their history and past performance tells a story of growth, predictability, and a steady stream of cash flow growth. These five stocks in a portfolio could literally be set and forget. While you watch another History Channel documentary, these companies will probably be busy winning the stock market. Though, I want to mention that past performance is not indicative of future gains, and that it's healthy to check the progress of your investments from time to time in order to make sure the investing thesis or business model hasn't changed. All right, you hairy lad, I'm off. Stay safe and have a good rest of your day. Bye-bye.